Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Davis. I'm a curator here at the Woodlove Collections. And it's my great honor to welcome you all to our event celebrating Armadillo Rising. We're so happy to have you join us today. And um, I'd like to ask, how many of you were here a few weeks ago when we had our homegrown event with the poster artists? All right, great. Well, welcome back to the Whitliffe Collections. We are here to celebrate those heady times when Austin was a Gruber's paradise, the best kept secret in America, and the city's cosmic capital was the Armadillo World Headquarters. Austin has changed a lot since then, of course. And the archives show us that it was about 1974 when Willie Nelson first began complaining to Bud Shrake about all the damn people moving into town. <laughs> and at that time, Willie had been living in Austin for less than four years. Bud had been there not quite six years. And Austin in the 70s was the best of times to hear people talk about it. And if you're one of those unfortunate souls who moved here after the Dillo closed in 1980, you got here too late and you missed everything. <laughs> and I know this because I moved here in 1981 and people tell me that constantly. <laughs> but I will say this is precisely why libraries and archives and museums exist to preserve these vital parts of our culture so that we can collect and pass along the stories to future generations. And this is what we've tried to do with both of our Austin music themed exhibits that we have up right now. Homegrown, which you see surrounding you here today, that was curated by my, by my colleagues, Katie Salzman and Alan Schaefer, who are here. And also the Armadillo Rising exhibit, which is around the corner near the bar in our writer's room. So for some reason we thought it was appropriate to put the bar in the writer's room. <laughs> and our Armadillo Rising exhibit draws from these incredibly rich archives that have been gifted to the Whitliffe collections by many generous donors. The items on display were given to us by Willie Nelson, Jerry Jeff Walker, Bill Arhos, Bill and Sally Whitliffe, Jerry Retzloff, Joe Nick Potowski, <coughs> Bud Shrake, Eddie Wilson, Doug Brown, Jack Jackson, Grover Lewis, Jesse Sublett, Jody Fisher, John T. Davis, Jan Reed, Ernie Girard of the Texas Tornadoes, and Tom Wilmore. And I will say that the Whitliffe Collections, you know, we're not an oil-rich university here, and um, <laughs> these collections are really remarkable because they are built by generous contributions from those of you who share our vision to collect, preserve, and showcase the best of Texas and Southwestern culture. And I know we have several donors here with us today, so I would just like to ask if you are a donor to the Whitliffe Collections, please do stand up so we can recognize you. Please stand. Come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. Come on, thank you, thank you. And I just want to take a, a moment to mention a couple of very uh, special donors who I want to say a word or two about. First, we have Mr. Jerry Retzloff. And I hope you all have had a chance to see this display we have from Jerry's amazing archive, which showcases his career as the man who brought about the Long Neck Revolution, who helped make Lone Star Beer the national beer of Texas, not to mention a musician's favorite, and Jerry did all of this while having a damn good time himself. And there we are gone. <laughs> and, and it's through Jerry's generosity to the Whitliff that you'll see these really cool vintage artifacts from Austin in the 70s. Uh, the armadillo ring, the spectacular photos of Jerry's good friend Willie Nelson, many rare, unique publications and ephemera, lots of amazing artwork. And let us not forget the official Lone Star Beer drinking glove. So Jerry, could you please stand again so we can thank you for your donations. <laughs> also want to recognize the contributions of Bill Arhos, the creator of Austin City Limits, who died last week at age 80 in Austin. 
Bill had hoped to be with us today. And I'm pretty sure that if Bill had come, he would have asked us to take that beautiful armadillo-themed guitar from Austin City Limits out of the case so he could have strummed it just a few more times. He loved that guitar. And um, I know that he was very proud to have his archive here. He knew that his creative legacy is being preserved and honored here at the Woodlock Collections and that we are deeply appreciative to him for that. And who knows, if we applaud loudly enough for Bill, he might just be able to hear us. So thank you, Bill. All of us. Okay, and as you can tell from our ambitious program, we have a lot going on today. Many moving parts, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what's going on. In a couple of minutes, we'll watch a short screening from a very cool documentary about the armadillo. After the film's over, I'll come back up here and briefly introduce our three distinguished guests who have a conversation. We'll follow that with a Q&A session, and then we will adjourn for our book signing party. And I want to mention something about the book signing. It won't be here. It's going to be around the corner at our official book signing table. So that will be the place to join your friends in line to get your book signed. And um, also why I have your attention, I just want to recognize a couple of the other special guests that we have here today. Um, we are privileged to have some of the poster artists from Homegrown back with us today. And could you guys please stand for us so we can say thank you again for your great work and for coming. Jim, Danny. Who else is here? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I know uh, many of you are relatively new visitors to Texas State and our campus here. And you may have noticed Texas State is thriving by every measure. And this is the direct result of our visionary and yet very practical-minded president, Dr. Denise Trout, who is here today. President Trout. We are also honored to have our vice president for information technology, a great man who is retiring at the end of this academic year and has done so much to support and help guide the Whitliff Collections during his tenure. Dr. Van Wyatt is here. We also have our assistant vice president in charge of the university library. Ms. Joan Heath is here with us. Joan. And you can see how important this event is to Texas State that we're bringing out all the big guns for you guys today. <laughs> and of course, we're delighted to have our founding donors, the incomparable Bill and Sally Whitliff here today. I'm going to try to wrap things up relatively quickly, but I do want to offer a quick word of thanks to our wonderfully talented events coordinator we have here at the Whitliff Collections, Lida Guz, who works so hard and so well to make these amazing programs happen. Thank you, Lida, for all you do. And also, our director, Dr. David Coleman, is here. And I want to mention that it was David who, when he heard of Katie Salzman's idea to do an exhibition of our poster art. Um, it was David who suggested that we try to create a book celebrating the poster artists. So we have David to thank for the inspiration that became this book, Homegrown. Thanks again, David. And we also have our editor of the book, Homegrown, Alan Schaefer, who's on faculty here at Texas State and did an amazing job making this book a reality. Thanks again, Alan, for everything done. And have you, all, have you all seen the book signing table that we have around the corner? Um, you know, UT Press, I don't think we even knew this was happening, did a very special limited hardback edition of Homegrown. And we sold quite a few of those at the last event. And we still have some left. I think we're just down to a few dozen at this point. So today's really your best chance to go ahead and get one of these um, collector's editions. Hey, well, um, as I've been saying, these collections are built from the contributions of many generous donors. And I'm going to give you one good example of how that works. Shortly after the Homegrown event, we received an email from Mark Hanna in Austin. Do any of you remember Mark Hanna from Channel 7 News? Yeah. Yeah. You may not know that beneath his 
suit when he was at the news desk. He wore just a pair of shorts most of the time. Um, but Mark sent us this email, and it said, I recently attended your panel discussion, noticed you had more upcoming events in regards to the old Armadillo World Headquarters. I'm pretty sure what you don't have is a documentary on the Alamo that Richard Gaylord and I produced while the Alamo was still alive and kicking. And Mark went on to write, we have never put it on YouTube or given out many copies. Getting the opportunity to meet Mr. and Mrs. Whitliff made me think of making this donation. And so we got in touch with Mark and before long we decided to do a little bit more than just accept a copy of the DVD for the archive. We came up with the idea to share an abbreviated 15 minute version of the film with uh, everybody here today. And Mark and Richard both had prior commitments so they could not be here, but they did manage to figure out a good way to introduce the film. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the rise and fall of the Armadillo World Headquarters. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Hanna. And I'm Richard Gaylord. We're sorry we couldn't be with you today on this very special occasion, but we are happy to present to you the shortened version of our documentary, The Rise and Fall of the Armadillo World Headquarters. 35 years ago, Mark and I worked together at KTBC, Channel 7 News. We took our idea to the news director, Dick Ellis, that we wanted to document the final months of the Armadillo World Headquarters. He thought it was a great idea, but he had a caveat. He says, okay, I'll let y'all put it together, but you're gonna have to come up with a five-part series that runs on the six o'clock news as well. We said, okay. Sound like a good deal. One of the things Mark and I wanted to do from the very beginning with this project was to let the folks who started the Dillo, the people that worked there, and the musicians who played there, tell this story in their own words. And we took advantage of it while it was still operating. We grabbed a hold of very special people, very special performances, a very special place and time in Austin, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, the rise and fall of the Armadillo World Headquarters. How'd you like that? <laughs> okay. I'm going to quickly introduce our three panelists so we can get on with our program. Our moderator is Jason Mellard, a cultural historian who teaches at Texas State, also serves as the assistant director for our Center for uh, Texas Music History here on campus. Jason has researched and written extensively on the armadillo, and in 2013 he published his first book, Progressive Country, How the 1970s Transformed the Texan in Popular Culture. Jason's book received the ultimate compliment, the acclaim of his peers. This book in 2013 was named by the Texas State Historical Association the best book published on Texas history. Jason, it's great to have you here at the introduction. And all of these books, all of the books I show you um, by our guests will be uh, available for sale over here around the corner. We also have Joe Nick Potowski here one of the great, all-time great writers to come from Texas. For many years, Joe Nick was Texas Monthly's most versatile writer, covering everything from substantive stories on the environment, to politics, and civil rights, along with his wide-ranging cultural reporting on phenomenon as diverse as Ralph the Swimming Pig and Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. Um, <laughs> In those uh, nearly two decades of reporting for Texas Monthly, the, it was the music reporting that really shone through as Joe Nick's deepest passion. And since leaving the Monthly, he's authored many outstanding books, nearly 10 in all by now. And um, chief among them are these biographies of Stevie Ray Vaughan and Willie Nelson, which Joe Nick will be signing today. And I'll mention that uh, for those of you who have the homegrown book or planning to get it, Joe Nick wrote this really amazing essay that uh, provides a great context and introduction to the entire scene in Austin during these years. Um, we're very privileged here at the Woodlife Collections to have Joe Nick's entire archive here. It's an immense treasure that he's gifted to us in an ongoing series of donations over the years. 
At last count, as of a couple of days ago, maybe it's more now, but at last count, there were um, 130 linear feet of material from Joe Nick, which amounts to over 250 archives boxes, for those of you keeping score. It's an incredible record of the life and career of a prolific and consequential writer. And I should add that Joe Nick, as many of you know, is much more than a writer. In one of his recent incarnations, he is the director of a new documentary on Doug Somm called Sir Doug and the Genuine Texas Groove. <laughs> this film premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year, and now Variety Magazine has named Joe Nick one of its 10 documentary makers to watch. So Joe Nick, congratulations on your new film, and welcome back to the Whitlock Collection. It's always great to have you here. And our other panelist, Mr. Eddie Wilson, the co-founder and guiding force of the Armadillo World Headquarters in his early years. And during his colorful life, uh, Eddie's done much more than his share to help keep Austin weird. Um, one of the writers in our collection, Gary Cartwright, once described Eddie in the pages of Texas Monthly as a human cannonball in chili pepper patterned pants, making deals and promoting liberal causes. And among other things, Eddie is surely the only person who has ever taken off his pants while introducing the governor of Texas at a public event. And in Eddie's defense, he said, I wanted to show off my armadillo boxer shorts. So, but behind the fun and games, which are abundant, Eddie's always had a very serious purpose. He's had a vision of Austin as a place that cultivates and celebrates creativity and innovation a place where live music could matter. After his time with the Armadillo, Eddie founded The Raw Deal, a hangout for writers, musicians, and politicos. It was The Raw Deal that helped launch the revival of Sixth Street. And The Raw Deal also had one of the all-time great mottos. Here it is. Remember, you found The Raw Deal. The Raw Deal didn't come looking for you. A few years after that, Eddie restored the old gas station and beer joint owned by his friend and mentor, Kenneth Threadgill, and then opened the first of his two Threadgill's restaurants, which are now, of course, Austin institutions. Eddie is also the author, author of this uh, very charming and quite useful Threadgill's cookbook, which has comics from Jack Jackson, uh, Armadillo scrapbook pages in here. And um, this book has sold thousands of copies, and Eddie is now down to just the last couple of dozen, which we have here today. So if you don't have this, or if you want to get another one as a gift for somebody, today's the perfect time to do that. And I just want to say, in closing, that uh, Eddie has arguably done as much as anyone to help make Austin a mecca for creative people, to make it one of the world's most admired cities. And Eddie, we're so delighted that you're joining us here today. Thanks very much. And let's get going. some of Steve's comments to say uh, how lucky we are, what an exciting season this has been for fans of Austin music history. The, the Whitliff has done so much to both preserve and celebrate um, this scene. And I think that one of our themes today is that it, it takes a village to make a scene. Uh, we're lucky to have so many influential people in this room, but I think just looking around, we know that it, it took so many to make Austin uh, the city that it is today. And so I thought I'd just throw onto the table um, some of the two big questions right away. Um, for Joe Nick, perhaps, um, why Austin? You know, at a time when, in the larger musical history of this state, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio all had a leg up, and then this happens. And then after that, um, from why Austin to why the Armadillo for Eddie, I know that once you have that vision at the Cactus Club, then it takes a team, right? That team comes together and the vision is a collective one. So why Austin and why the Armadillo? I, I think why, why Austin, Austin was al always here for people that were different, that had ideas that didn't fit in to wherever they grew up in, at least in Texas. And that was forever thus, but it seemed like even throughout the 60s, if you had countercultural ideas, Austin was, what, four houses on 33rd Street. It was pretty <laughs> limited, so you had to leave and go somewhere else. In most cases, it was San Francisco. There was definitely a pipeline. 
and uh, to a lesser extent, Los Angeles, New York, or even musically speaking, uh, Nashville. But what happened to me in the 1970s, and the Armadillo was definitely the catalyst, is people quit having, didn't have to leave anymore. And the, and the migration reversed, and first it was people came back from San Francisco and LA. Austin was that one place counterculturally where there was critical mass in Texas where there wasn't, there were scenes in Dallas, Houston, Fort Worth, San Antonio and all the urban areas, but they were pretty minuscule. In Austin there was critical mass. It started with the Vulcan as, as being a cultural center in the 60s, but definitely with the Armadillo, it got big. And you started noticing bands that you really liked. I was, I was a disc jockey at a, a underground FM in uh, Arlington and started noticing like Captain Beefheart, Burrito Brothers, bands like that, Ry Cooter, they weren't stopping in Dallas or Fort Worth, much less Houston or San Antonio. Their only stop in Texas was the Armadillo. And, and it really was, what happened is all of a sudden people started coming from anywhere else and it wasn't just Texas, but they started coming from the rest of the United States. I always look at Asleep at the Wheel as kind of being a catalyst. They were looking for American roots music and the music they'd been playing to hippies in Berkeley and uh, people in the East Coast, all of a sudden they found old folks here that knew and understood their music and the kids loved it. So it was uh, right place at the right time. <laughs> Couldn't have happened anywhere else. And uh, I like what Bill Bentley has made the point that what started in Austin in the early 70s, and it, was, it wasn't just any kind of music, but it was attention to where music came from. It was all of a sudden liking your mama's and daddy's music. Through Willie Nelson, you could listen to country music. It was all of a sudden cool, or was never cool. But similarly, with all these different kinds of music, so rhythm and blues, the blues scene that uh, ultimately uh, Clifford Anto capitalized on, there was already a great attention to where blues music was coming from. Places like the One Night, the IL Club, and if you were really good, you could get a gig at the Armadillo. So all these roots musics that are now <coughs> celebrated and taken for granted <coughs> as Americana music, uh, Austin is where the first place people start paying attention to it on a scale that it was. And then when uh, someone started honking the horn and announcing to the rest of the world through media, this is going on, then it became a big deal. Then people started coming in in droves, and then Willie started complaining about it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, who are these catalysts for the catalyst, Eddie? Where is hey, the Well, it the started team? in the 20s when the University of Texas was <clears throat> introducing radio and, and dances in the Driscoll Hotel were broadcast all the way to Canada and Mexico. Uh, it, Austin, Austin in the 20s was already weird. And uh, <laughs> my landlord downtown, Moton Crockett, had a Crockett Orchestra that played every Saturday night through the 40s <coughs> at the Stephen F. Austin. And uh, UT sorority girls were meeting officers and, you know, the inbreeding started. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, in, the, in the 20s and the 30s, Austin was already getting attention from all over the country. And so the, the self-fulfilling prophecy about, about Austin that probably started in 1709 when the Indians and the French discovered, you know, that nibbles got hard in Barton Springs. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's always been, it's always been a fountain of youth. And, uh, it, it, the, uh, the talent that was already here in the 60s, Travis High School and Rocky Erickson, Lanier High School had Don Hyde, who gave us mescaline and swapped it to Osley for acid. Uh, McCallum High had Travis Rivers that I met as a 12-year-old. Scary guy. You know, we worked at Kittyland Park together. And, uh, and he, more than anybody else, single-handedly helped start the summer of love because he knew those artists really needed pot. <laughs> Gary Scanlon, you know, who, who Don Hyde incorporated to help open the Vulcan, uh, who had Houston White from McCallum help. Uh, 
there was local talent. Carl Sandberg came to my junior high at University Junior High. And you know, I spent years trying to figure out why that old guy was so important. <laughs> you know, Doug Scales at the body shop behind the armadillo finally came over when he saw some of my skinny hippies hitting themselves with chip concrete because they're trying to get the, the post buried in concrete out of the beer garden and, and we had never talked and he came across the parking lot and I could see Dodge City everywhere and I went out to him and, and he loomed out at me and he said, Wilson, you made a liar out of me. Why did I do that? I always said hippies wouldn't work. <laughs> Y'all are over there busting your ass and it really doesn't have to be that hard. And he sent over a wrecker to just yank up those posts like weeds. And his body shop workers then drank more beer per capita and per pound than any bunch of little guys you ever saw. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, I did what I thought the instructions were. I prepared, you know, 40 minutes that I could do without taking a breath. And then just before we started, I found out that I had six minutes. So, <laughs> if, I, if I'd have had all the time that they had introducing me, we'd already know everything there is to know. <laughs> So I'm going to start at the back and work forward. <laughs> There's a tribute list that is the scariest thing I've ever worked on for fear I'd leave somebody out. When I saw Bill, I was going to point out that I had Shrake on it. But I had forgotten to bold his name, and I couldn't find it without my reading glasses. So I froze up, Bill. But there he is right there, Bill. <laughs> my, my mother, Beulah Wilson, run a day nursery school where I learned to cook. And she let me take the bus from the time I was 10 years old all the way from Duval Street down to 6th and Congress where I could get out by my Hardy Boy book in the basement of Scarborough's until I discovered that across the street they had the brand new Playboy that had just started coming. <laughs> if you thought Austin was cool in the 60s, you should have been here in 1951 when Jane Mansfield was starring in 12 nights in a bar room. <laughs> she lived here. Farrah Fawcett, Ann Richard, big brassy blondes have always been the key to the success of all <laughs> My tribute starts with my mama. Goes straight into Stan Alexander, who's the best baritone country singer I've ever heard taught me freshman English when I was 17 at UT, 1961 in the summer. He was singing at Threadgill's, and he was the best singer that's ever set foot in Threadgill's before or since. Thank you, Spencer Perskin, for giving me the chance to try to manage Shiva's headband, the most impossible job <laughs> anybody ever tackled, but I tried. Thank you, Spencer Perskin, for having the brilliance to have Jim Franklin do your label, your logo, your album cover. Imagine without Jim Franklin trying to run something called Possum World Headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim Franklin, for your biggest contribution to Armadillo World Headquarters. Bobby Hedder. <laughs> Jim came to me a couple of three weeks before I opened that big, dumb, ugly building, and he said, I've got somebody that you desperately need. You don't know a thing about this, and this guy suffered through the last years of the Vulcan. He knows what you need to know, and Bobby's a reason the place stayed open as long as it did. Mike Hare, rest in peace. Jan Beeman, rest in peace. Bill Narum, all the people that, that contributed untold energy, talent, selflessness, that they're gone. Mike Tollison, 
for being an Armadillo World Headquarters, Thomas Jefferson, his moral compass, his cultural arts lab inspiration. When he came to see me the first time, he was just back from London, and he had seen what John Lennon was trying to do there, and I adopted, I hated the word club. I didn't want to be a club operator. Musicians hated club operators. We became a cultural petri dish. <laughs> <laughs> Woody Roberts, the radio genius from San Antonio, who taught me that every day is worth a very close examination and a lot of exhilaration. Chet Flippo, Ed Ward, Bud Schreck, for spreading the rumor that there was something really special going on here. All the people and all the staffs that made up Armadillo World Headquarters over the years even those that hated my guts. <laughs> Hank Ulrich, for believing that Armadillo was worth every nickel he had and still kept mopping the floor after he gave me every nickel he had. Joe Gracie, for being a good friend, inspiration. When we first talked about it, Joe said, you know, if you and me and Willie Nelson could convince this lady that owns this station that we can run it for her, we could really have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite work out that way, but KOKE was the most fun anybody ever had with a local radio station. <laughs> Richard Zolade, who has taught me how to research Austin history and built a fire under me for trying to learn everything I can from those microfilms that make my eyes go bad. <laughs> and Jesse Sublett, for setting the bar so high for ethical heroics that I have absolutely no pressure to try to measure up. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> you know, it, it took a lot of people, a lot of effort and and I can tell you more than you want to know, but that's probably all the time I got. <laughs> we love you. It seems like long before social media, Austin understood what relationships meant, and I think that's one of the best characterizations of the scene that I've heard in a long, long time. We have, we've got that scene built. These are the people that made Austin what it is. Now let's bring that music into our earshot here. Uh, Joe Nick, as a journalist, one of those writers who you know, brought the people in, um, I wanted to ask, y'all have probably seen a lot of music in your day, um, and I'm not going to ask you to pick favorites, but I'm going to ask for you to think about maybe a most memorable performance or a performer who affected you the most? That's, that's not a fair question to ask at the Armadillo. It depends on, on which night. You know, yeah, I was there when, when I thought I saw Alvin Crow blow away Bruce Springsteen. But Bruce Springsteen came back for more. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, but from that and, and getting to see, you know, people that I'd never been exposed to before, that was the most fun. Old and New Dreams which was Ornette Coleman's backup band that kept playing this free experimental jazz from the 50s, which was hardly intelligible in the 1970s, but they were, you know, to get to talk to Dewey Redmond, who was from Fort Worth, who played in that band. That was totally cool to, to see The Clash and Elvis Costello. I remember the first time seeing Talking Heads and then uh, being in line at the bar afterwards at Soap Creek saying, Boy, that lead singer is just one of the weirdest ones I've ever. He could have been from the state hospital, and I looked around, and there's David Byrne right behind. Him. Uh, no, there. Uh, you know, seeing the Ramones for the first time uh, when there were hardly any people there. I mean, that's uh, that was the fun of, of getting to see people before it, uh, the general public got on to them. Unfortunately, those fun nights were the ones that were really making the people at the Armadillo complained because they weren't making money those nights, but the willingness to expose. Well, especially that jazz that I don't think they get enough credit for in the later years. This is real important that, that in the later years, as Austin had grown musically and become 
a capital. It had become more tribal, multi-tribal. So there were all these different scenes. You know, if you're into reggae, there was a scene for you. And I remember it was still in the 70s when first time I saw a bunch of guys in trench coats and, and Vespas driving down the street, and they were all into ska, and there were mods and, and that scene. But if you had a significant tribal community musically, you probably would go to the Armadillo to see the best representative of your tribe if there was a touring member. So, you know, punk new wave was like the best of the best there. And it was, by then it wasn't so much local, but it was getting to see all these new hot acts. And the exposure was what was fun. If you were willing to go out and cough up, yes, even $5 on some nights, uh, you, were getting, you were exposed to this unintentional musical education. And again, I mean, just from the very beginning, there was not a night that uh, there wasn't something interesting. And I think one of my favorite nights, you're asking about a night, is maybe I'm obsessed with uh, Doug Som right now, but the triple bill of Freddie Fender, think about this, Freddie Fender, Rocky Erickson, and Doug Som, the same triple bill, and it all made perfect sense. <laughs> that's, that's the armadillo, that's Austin. And that's why we were different than everywhere else and kind of proud of it. We were glad not to be, you know, part of this bigger scene. We, we, people had also wanted recognition. And that was always there. It was more like at that time if there was an attitude, it was just like, we're not Nashville. And that was enough. You know, that was just, you know, th there's a lot of people. That's all I need to hear and start bringing people in. But there was much more to it. And it was a very sophisticated <laughs> scene. And the armadillo reflected that. There were still people that, bands that filled the stereotype that would come and play. And country rock and cosmic cowboy stuff continued, but the level of sophistication, and this doesn't include theater or ballet, uh, it's kind of off the charts. And, and it did more than anything to me to make the alternative and counterculture mainstream in Austin. And whatever Austin is today, it's that. I mean, our culture, is alternative and, and counterculture. That's what continues to draw people in, even if I'm not sure it exists anymore. The dark side, <laughs> the dark side of some of those experiments. Uh, the Opera House that was going to put us out of business and recruited that way. They had air conditioning, down. right? They had air conditioning. Air conditioning and, and mixed drinks. And carpet. <laughs> uh, but when they shut, when they had to shut the doors, they had already paid for a Ray Charles show that we got to put on. They double billed Ray Charles with David Allen Coe. So we got the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> and as David and as the David Allen Coe fans grew impatient with Ray <laughs> Charles, they started to boo. <laughs> you know, the fact that I'm not doing life right now just happens to be, you know, because somebody got to live that shouldn't have. <laughs> Ask Bobby, well, you know, you, you remember a great show. He said, I remember the time that Nicky Hopkins went out to the piano, sat down, and fell over with his head on the keyboard, and that was it. He was, <laughs> he was gone. And our, his friend Robert Gower, the giant stage manager, picked him up and just leaned the microphone and said, That's it, folks. <laughs> Dead weight. Uh, uh, and there were dozens and dozens and hundreds, long, slow nights with nobody there. And nobody ever talks about that because it's not any fun even to try to remember, much less to try to convince somebody that you should know about this. It was miserable, miserable, miserable. And Freddie King wasn't mentioned. You know, I watched a little yeah. piece of film and an inaccuracy here and an inaccuracy there. I ended up getting on, just on. Freddie King was the number one guy at the Armadillo World Headquarters for bringing us the rent money, for paying the bills, for never changing the 50-50 deal that he made the first time for playing with whoever we put with him, uh, for bringing Leon Russell to us. When Leon started Shelter and said, Freddie, I want to take you to LA and cut a live record. He said, no, we're going to do it at the Armadillo World Headquarters. You got to hear those kids. And, and then, you know, Leon was ours. 
He was there at the re recently after when the, his movie premiered and started telling me about his great experience playing with the Grateful Dead. And I said, that was on Thanksgiving in 1972. He said, it was Thanksgiving, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and brought him over to the wall and showed him the picture of him playing with Jerry Garcia playing Steel and Doug Song leading the band. Garcia the one going on stage. Let, let's wait till Doug gets here. Of course, Doug's always late. But he said, Doug should be the band leader. He's the one that knows a thousand songs. And Leon told an audience at Threadgill's, it was the worst performance I've ever given because I was always used to playing arrangements and these guys were jamming. He said, the first time I'd jammed in years. Uh, it was something different for everybody, always, every night. Nobody in the world had a better logo than the one Jim Franklin created for Armadillo World Trade Center. <laughs> you still want to be bummer, don't you? <laughs> the, Jim Franklin created a logo that told the story. An armadillo is all, you know, they haven't evolved in 60 million years. It's the <laughs> oldest mammal on the planet that hasn't evolved. And the reason that we're losing our little toe and the armadillo is not is because somewhere back there, we had people messing around in the woodpile. <laughs> the armadillo is always born of a quartered egg. Four males or four females. So they can't fool around in the first generation and they don't evolve and change like we do. <laughs> Jim Franklin's logo has the entire story right there in that beautiful, beautiful logo. Nobody had a master of ceremonies. We did. <laughs> we had a master of ceremonies who created a new ceremony for every event, not like <laughs> anybody else ever had. You could hear, you could hear a, a, a strange sort of musical tone being repeated, and you would try to focus, and you would see that this, this creature that had horns and a shell and kind of an old felt hat and a tube going out of its mouth into a microphone way down there. And it was an electrical conduit that he'd found under the stage. But he was playing it here, and the sound was coming out of the microphone over there. And then he would come swooping down off the stage in maybe a Mr. Peanuts suit <laughs> on roller skates. <laughs> this is an incredible athlete. He'd out roller skate anybody you've ever seen. And he would skate down a run a, a board that he had put that we didn't know what was doing there. And he would fly out into the audience and zip around these little stone kids from Caldwell. <laughs> looking at us. Oh my God. You know, I mean, people went people went back to little villages all over central Texas telling stories that nobody's ever gonna believe. <laughs> Bill Narum moved up from Houston with tape with with Space City Video, cops kicked the shit out of them in Houston. So they migrated to Austin, couldn't find a place to rent. So they went to Maynard and found a mansion out on the <laughs> outskirts and became Taylor Vision. They brought all their porta packs, all their video equipment, half inch black and white stuff, D discovered that the little cinder block building in front of the mansion had a cable going in one side, cable going out the other, their landlord owned the cable company. Two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning after Armadillo shows, they get back to Taylor and put on reel-to-reel -reel videotape of these kind of scenes and 400 homes in Taylor, Texas were the only place in the universe <laughs> that could see what had just happened in Armadillo. <laughs> There's a lot of kids in Taylor went on to very dramatical careers. <laughs> And that's a great example of how the armadillo fostered other people's creativity. And then Jim Franklin, of course, going on to work with the Ritz Theater. And y'all have mentioned the Opry House and Antones. And could maybe we speak a little bit about how the armadillo fit into you know, creating these other spaces, these other tribes, a place like Soap Creek, maybe? There, there were, in the early 70s, the armadillo was the concert hall 
and there were all these, there were smaller clubs and they catered to different specific clientele. Split Rail never covered charge. And they would have mainly, you know, country, uh, country rock type acts. It had been previously one of these places Long Hairs didn't go to, but uh, I think Kenneth Redgill broke their Long Hair line. Uh, uh, you know, certainly Soap Creek was kind of a, it was a satellite of, it could not have existed without the Armadillo. It was like a smaller version that was the club that you didn't want to run. Uh, it wasn't like an events hall or something like that. And it was outside the city limits. And they could sell mixed drinks and, and it was a little easier to do stuff outside without worrying about getting caught. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Scales was always just seeing that sign was like, you'd watch yourself if you're in the parking lot then at the Armadillo. Plus if it was dark, the potholes could swallow you. <laughs> I mean, but, but it was, it was, there were a bunch of clubs. I remember the Alliance Wagon Yard popping up for a while. For, for folk people like Spellman's, uh, the Alamo Lounge, Emma Joe's, but they were all always specific. To me, when the Opry House opened up, it was like, it was a throwdown. You know, we're not the Armadillo, we're the same capacity, we're gonna steal your ax, and not only do we have carpet, but we do have air conditioning mixed drinks. And it did draw, uh, Willie, I think, started playing there a lot. Willie and Waylon played there a lot. You, you lost a lot of business, as I recall. But seven months, seven months later, when they were going, when they were going down, they lost their liquor license. Uh, we did them a benefit. Uh, <laughs> Michael, Michael Murphy told his manager, "Call Eddie and tell him I'm not going to play next week, like we had an agreement to. I'm going to play the Opera House instead. They, they need a benefit." Larry Watkins. His manager said, Michael, why don't you call him? I quit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we let him go ahead. It happened to be my birthday. I was 33. I rolled 33 joints and took them in my vest pocket over to the opera house. <laughs> Bud was with me. <laughs> Michael was very nervous when he heard I was there. <laughs> He found out it was my birthday, so he introduced me to the audience and brought me out on, on stage so that maybe I, I wouldn't rip his throat out in front of everybody. And I made a little speech about how all you people put at risk all the jobs of all of our employees every time you go into a place and light up, because we have to make it on our beer and alcohol sales. And so when we come down on you, remember that. In the meantime, Remember, that this place doesn't have a license to play. <laughs> and it, it, it looked like Yankee Stadium with Babe Ruth hitting foul balls and the people jumping <laughs> all over the place. And we went back to the house and Bud said, I remember every word you said and I'm gonna write a really great piece about it. <laughs> I don't think he I don't think he ever put a pencil to paper for me again after that. But the the competition was vicious, and yet it, the attrition kind of all took care of itself. It's important to, when you study the history, nobody has ever pointed out that the Vulcan Gas Company and the checkered flag, which presented, you know, white Republican folk music. Rod Kennedy. Rod Kennedy and the Vulcan Gas Company opened almost the exact same time in 67. And, and, and nobody's ever pointed it out anywhere, and they were just going. And what was the checkered flags? Uh, <coughs> they had a little oh, it was gimmick. A, it, it was a, well, it was Jackie Rod Kennedy. It was the only folk music club in America that was built around formula race cars. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Mance used to really love, you know, <laughs> uh, and at the Vulcan, they were booking Big Mama Thornton. They were booking Big Joe Williams. They were doing the real deal. And all you read on the front page of the paper in Ray Waddell's column is how these shirtless hippies were gathering in the street out to the center stripe on Congress Avenue in full view of the Capitol and, 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 and breaking every moral code in the whole world. But they were, they were being creative and, and Rod Kennedy 
who are you know, getting ready to start the Kerrville <coughs> Folk Festival. And uh, there, you know, and that was Austin, Texas. We had all the extremes and things blossomed, you know, in, in the alleys and withered and died in the sun. And, and you know, God bless Michael Murphy and, and Rod Kennedy and all those people. But the Vulcan Gas Company was the real creative heart and soul of Austin, Texas before the Armandale ever opened its door. <laughs> And you know, that, that blossoming still goes on. There's a lot of grumbling today about the growth of Austin, about the changes it's undergoing. Um, and a lot of those things come from, stem from, this creativity of the 60s and the 70s. But I was wondering if we might find a way to put a positive spin on that or to think about it. Do you all ever you know, reflect on your continuing roles and the roles that you played in making the city what it is, continue to play it through Threadgills, through you know, the latest with the Doug Somm documentary? Uh, and maybe give us an insight into what you see in Austin today that can still excite you. Something that gives you hope, an artist, a development, a person. <laughs> hey, look, I, I really miss a lot of what I got to grow up with. And that time was magic. Ain't gonna get it back. It really was good. And if you got here in 74, I got to Austin permanently in 73. If you got here in 74, you missed it. <laughs> and I'll keep saying that. But no, I I'm I to this day I'm I'm in awe of what I see. I worry if we've created too much and if there's you know, there's a limit. Uh have you gone over the limit? Have you choked everything? Can you get around? If if you uh it, have his money uh, uh, basically trump creativity finally? Because that's, your line, Eddie, I remember back in the early 70s was, and he was, he was quick for a quip then, and he's probably the first one to do it effectively and make, I mean, everybody beats a path to Eddie, but it's said, Austin, cheapest cost of living in the United States, which was true at the time of the 100 largest cities in the United States, Austin was the cheapest cost of living in the early 70s, but it's also cheap beer and cheap pot. And, uh, and those are elements, we're talking about right place and right time. Yes, that meant things all, everywhere in the United States. But here, I think geographically, uh, in particular, it meant a whole lot. And where hippies didn't drink, uh, you know, alcohol, maybe they drank in San Francisco, but it wasn't talked about. Here, you can't, be, you can't be any kind of person, much less a hippie and survive a summer, especially without air conditioning, without drinking beer. I mean, that's just a fact of life. And I think the drinking age was lower too, right? Well, that's, that was in the early 70s when... Yeah, it was, it was, that was from 73 to 81, and that's the secret that nobody talks about, but that's what made the whole thing happen. Drinking age dropped from, from 21 to 18 all over Texas, but at the, was it the same year in Austin, all of a sudden, uh, hard liquor came in, you could buy mixed drinks, and you could stay open past midnight. You could stay open until two o'clock. And that changed a lot. The naysayers remind me of horses when they were lips go <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, naysayers die off when, when, when they start to flag in a race and they start to get further and further behind. They start going, hey, they ain't gonna make it, you know. Uh, there's, you know, there's always gonna be those blubbering, you know. I think I've heard you call it the Austin culture of nyan nyan nyan. Yeah, well that's the nyan 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 nyan. That's our theme song. <laughs> yeah. And you can hear it. Just you know, sometimes you put your wood out there. <laughs> it's all around, you know, and uh, it's. It's a sad thing, but true. You know, it uh, it takes a whole lot of complainers to you know make the the rest of everybody sound pretty good. And, you know, country music is is not always about uplifting moral. You know, uh, you know, the rising. Uh, but but it's uh, it's all real it's all real soulful stuff. There's just there's just nothing quite as 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 much of a drag on anybody's boat as, as somebody predicting that it's going to turn over. 
<laughs> you know, no matter what it is, and I wonder when I sit and try to commute in traffic and I'm stuck, I, I'm 35 anywhere, and I'm, I'm wondering, God, why would anyone want, they're still coming. And they're still coming for what I call the wrong reasons. Although maybe some people are actually coming for work and salaries because Austin's got a good job market. But most people come because this is where I can work out my ideas. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not sure whether it's here and it's hard to be, it's hard to be a slacker or a hippie today and go into Austin and buy in. It's like, oh, I'm gonna move to uh, Soho in Manhattan be an artist. You know, where's your trust fund? <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to buy in, but I see it, it's just moving out in areas and like, you know, San Marcos is a pretty great area. The, I like the area around Manchac and Slaughter and up on Burnett. There's these little satellite cool areas of what used to be the unhippest part of town. And I mean, every part is hip now and cool. But, you know, it's getting commodified a little bit too much for my own good. At the same time, I still see where else are people going. They're not all of a sudden moving. Uh, poor Houston. They're always, you know, we've got more diversity in Dawson, so over. It's like, I don't see anyone moving to Houston. <laughs> Ain't nobody moving to Dallas because it's the new hot spot. <laughs> you're moving for work. And even if you're moving for work to Austin, you're getting that added benefit. The problem is it's not. First it was just Texas. Kids from Texas. Then the 70s became national. It's global now. What bothers me now is you've got speculators. You've got real estate people. You've got hedge fund people that are buying real estate and jacking up prices to make it unaffordable and I worry about all those things but they're still coming for the wrong reasons and, and the wrong reasons whatever you say about the Vulcan uh, I, I still think the wrong reasons was the critical mass that started in the 70s not the 60s all right well let's uh, I think we've reached the end of our program that sounds about right um, <laughs> There's a, there, there's an event that we brought a few handbills far out at the table, but within the space of this next week, there will be a, a web presence, and my, my new best, best friend in the world, Rob Burley of Burley Auction Gallery in New Braunfels, will start promoting an armadillo poster art auction that will take place on Sunday the 3rd, of May, it's not it's not long, so save your money. <laughs> uh, we've got a big part, anywhere from a half a dozen to twenty-five pieces from the the artists themselves. I guess I've got a couple that I might sell too, because so I got two. <laughs> but but there's going to be a, a, an online auction that will also happen in the beer garden at Threadgill's downtown on Sunday the 3rd of May and we're going to see if they can share some of that magic that I experienced at Burley just recently when when um, uh, I had the most <laughs> when he starts that auction chatter <laughs> I leaned forward to Jesse who was moving his lips a little bit that auction and I said I said Jesse it's almost like yodeling and Jesse said an opera. <laughs> and and uh, everybody gets excited and everybody's got just a few minutes to decide how bad they might want something. And God almighty, oh it, uh, it, it, uh, I caught up from years and years and years of personal mismanagement uh, in, uh, in that one day. And, and nobody, can, nobody can find anything in any of my re the restaurants or the house to miss it. You know? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but it, it's a lot of fun, and, and, and good deals can be had by all. And, and those guys produced some of the best art in America. Yeah, see you around, yeah. And they're right here. We, so get a piece of it while you can. 
We do have some time for questions and answers. Uh, and beer. Continue the conversation. Yeah. How, how did you come up with the title for Armadillo World Headquarters? Now the world's coming here. What was the question? How did you come up with the title World Headquarters? I mean, well, you know, it was it was never any doubt about whether, you know, as soon as I asked Bud Schreck, you know, what do you think about Armadillo National Headquarters? He said, well, national's not really a happening word right now, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and so it immediately became world headquarters and everything else is just follow through on a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> Dan, thank you for the question. I just wanted to salute Eddie for the diversity and the courage to bring so many different uh, genres of, of music and entertainment. The Earl of Ruston, some of you old timers may have enjoyed that. The Earl of Ruston was just an absolutely wonderful musical play that Eddie hosted there for a while. I'm sure some people in this room were there, but I, I salute you for all of it. Well, a lot of it, a lot of it was circumstantial. You know, a lot of people thought it was just utter brilliance that we opened a Bob Skagg show with the moods of country music. <laughs> Back to the matter is, the moods were booked, <laughs> and all of a sudden we had a shot at Boz. So I had to ask the moods, you know, would y'all mind taking, you know, $300 instead of 50%? They weren't going to make $300 on their 50%. No. <laughs> and every one of them said, open for Boz Skaggs, woohoo! Oh, yeah. So I had the Moods posters that they put out for their dance hall gigs with a place to write across the bottom where they play. And so there's the Moods of Country Music on the front door at Armadillo. <laughs> and with a marks I said, and featuring Boz Skaggs <laughs> and his red hot San Francisco band. So sitting in the office waiting for the waiting for the buses to get in. My door comes flying open and Boz's little brother is the road manager for that that tour comes rushing in with the poster that he had ripped off the front door. He said, Boz will have a fit if he sees this. <laughs> you know I said, we're probably not gonna play Boz next time. He's gonna go to the opera house where they got air conditioning. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> Some people don't sweat that good. <laughs> At the back. Hello. Can you hear me? No. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I've grown up around Austin. Oh. Can you hear me? No. I've grown up around Austin um, most of my entire life, and I've seen it. I've seen it change a lot. And, you know, I, I spent a year abroad and I came back and there were probably four skyscrapers that I hadn't seen before. Um, but my question is, I think that it, there's still some hope with people who still have that, that drive to want to see Austin maintain what it is and maintain its identity. I've been all over the world and I still come back to Austin. And what, what do you think, as people who witnessed kind of that, that that birth of conception of, of what Austin is now, as it was taken, I didn't. What, what is your perspective on all that? What do you see happening? What do you see needs to be done? Especially from people my age who are, who are gonna inherit this soon. All we have to do is just keep, you know, people like you open and giving us it, it'll happen. <laughs> I have two sons, both of whom were born in Austin, one of whom has traveled around the world pretty much. He came back, he's in Austin. The other one is in San Marcos. I think they choose pretty well. And, and I mean, again, I don't, in most places in the United States at least, when someone gets of a certain age, what do you do in your town? You leave. Austin's one of the few places where it's like, you can leave, then why leave? You know, pretty soon you end up coming back for all the reasons that you got it's to still, It's still here, but you just got to dig for it. That's another reason that the armadillo is such a good symbol. You know, it, it's, it's like the hippies were, but, but said in Sports Illustrated, for God's sakes. You know, the armadillo shares its home with others as it burrows. A lot of people think it's not that good looking, but it's a survivor. Uh, 
there's there's every reason in the world to just follow the lead and 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 you know it's got a tough shell. You know? We're not we're not just nobody's rolling over and giving up. Uh, you know that's that's the reason when you get old you have to get involved in politics about the same time that you start worrying about your health insurance and your burial plan. <laughs> I didn't make any money at your armadillo, but I had a really good auction at Burley it, uh, <laughs> about six weeks ago. Uh, damnest thing I've ever seen. And I mean, people would come, were coming up with tears streaming down their cheeks, holding a $35 poster that I bought just to decorate the downtown store. I mean, I, I didn't collect them back then. I bought all of that stuff to decorate the store. I loved it all. I bought a whole lot more than I could I could put up. I've got more. Uh, but uh, but the fact of the, the fact of the matter the fact of the matter is people are emotionally charged to try to pick up a piece of the past. And I can't think of a healthier sign I've ever seen that goes toward that investment that we've got to make in the future if we're gonna if we're gonna you know see our kids grow up here. The last couple of years, by the way, the armadillo, it was turning a profit. It was actually a successful enterprise. The last year. The last year. <laughs> Burley. Hey, I just wanted to point out something. I, when I did Eddie's sale, I also did, in the past, I've done the last of the Roy Rogers Museum where we had national publication, we had everything. And we had, you know, Roy Rogers touched a lot of people's lives. I have never had people waiting in line. I never had to postpone an auction a half hour to get everybody in the door. I've never had that much energy in a room. The the people that love Austin, the people the people that grew up there, the people that experienced the I mean, I feel like I missed out on so much. I gotta I gotta see it all firsthand through your eyes, and I learned a lot. But this the armadillo had more of an effect on people personally than anything. And we we do this stuff all the time. We've been doing it ten years. I've never seen anything like that, and people. I've never sold three things, and we sold the three Willie Nelson posters, three of the same posters. The first one brought two grand, the next one brought two grand. I said, this is the last one, and we don't even have it here. It brought 3700 We found out he didn't even have another one. We had to go find one. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't give it to him. So. Oh, yeah. A, a, friend of, a friend of ours came to the auction and was sitting next to Sandra, and she, as the first two sold, she leaned over and she said, you know, Eddie gave me one of those years ago. We have it framed at the house. So... Rob called me and said, man, I got myself in some deep stuff here. <laughs> he, said, he said, it's a real good customer. Ask Gatelman, your assistant was who it was. <laughs> oh my God, I'm, okay. So I said, Sandra, call, call Lockhart quick and ask Carol. And she, Carol said, well, I, just, I don't need to charge him for it. I'll just, he gave it to me, i just give it back. Said, Carol, come on, we can do that. She said, well, I'm, I'll think about it and I'll call you back. She's a master's pentathlete weight strength champion. And she's, she called back in, in about 10 minutes. She said, I'm saving money to get my, my airplane fare to Paris for the, the international master's competition in August. And if Eddie could get that $3,500 for it, and you, and give me just half of it, that's exactly what my ticket costs. <laughs> and, we, and, and you need to be pulling for Carol Finsrud this, this, this August if you happen to follow the Masters. She's just the finest person in the whole world, and, and, uh, and, and I maybe know where there's one more of those. Anybody else? <laughs> Mr. Davis. Eddie. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Well, it's as far as I can get from here and, and find people that really like my cooking. Uh, you know, one of the main things about New Zealand, besides us, we have friends there because Sandra's daughter was in the Xena Warrior Princess television show, you know. And Bobby just walked 1,800 miles from the north tip to the south tip scouting locations for a thread fields <laughs> down under. And, <laughs> And down there, we're all wetbacks. <laughs> <laughs>
Is it uh, Caroline? Yes, uh, I'd like to ask you about the punk connection at the Armadillo. You know, Iggy Pop and the Runaways and the Ramones. I saw the Talking Heads first show, maybe 200 people were there. Who was in the Armadillo that was booking the punk shows and how did that work in with all the rest of the people there? Well, <laughs> the kitchen, after I left, you know, I was, I was from pre-punk days, but when Hank, Took over. He was the one that's responsible for all that incredible jazz that nobody came to see. <laughs> In the kitchen, we had early coming up punks, and they just simply lobbied, and and Hank ran, you know, that kind of genial dictatorship that you know we call democracy. Uh, it was his money. When I gave him the keys, I said, "Man, I can't get your money back." You know, you got to do it yourself. I went across the river and opened a 30-seat place called a raw deal that had 120 month rent on it. And the motto was, "You found a raw deal. Raw deal didn't come looking for you." <laughs> and I had to start my life all over with my tail between my legs. And Hank, who had saved the armadillo and still kept mopping the floor, took my keys to try to get his money back. And he brought some, you know, he brought some business-like thinking to it, although. I mean, there, there's a lot of a lot of personal discoveries, you know, that still come out after all these years. You know, where there's we still have conspiracy theories about certain people that were there. Uh, but uh, God bless him. If it wasn't for Hank, the place would have gone down in about 18 months of opening, and nobody would have ever heard about it. Nobody'd be talking about it now. But because because of him, and of course because of a, a legion of other people, but in the bloody end, it was it was Hank, and he he finally had it turned around. His brother came in and put some more money in it, and uh, and they and, and because they kept it going, because Hederman came to me and kept it going, and before we all flipped out and had to get the hell out of there because we were going down, uh, Hank picked it up and just you know did a masterful job of keeping it going. Mike Tolson and and. Uh, Bill Nerum. One of the great achievements that came out of Armadillo World Headquarters was was Austin Community Television. You know, nobody, you know, because of Tolson and 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 Nerum, with Nerum's help, Ann Seaman, who's you know wrote the great book about Madeline Murray O'Hare, told me the wonderful story about going up to the Mount Barker with a reel-to-reel -reel performance tape that they had produced at Armadillo. And they got the instructions about how to, how to hook it up to the Mount Barker Tower. And it didn't quite work. Bill Nerum climbed the tower high enough to find a place where he could unhook San Antonio <laughs> and hook up this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder at the bottom of the tower. And they cranked it on and Ann jumped in her car and drove down to the convenience store to Low Water Crossing and called her roommate at home to see if anything came up on the blank channel six. <laughs> and that was the birth of Austin Community Television. <laughs> and that was Mike Tolleson's passion and he is the reason that it happened. And Armadillo provided the workspace for those kind of projects that couldn't have happened anywhere else. It didn't cost very much. I think we have time for one more. Okay. And can you tell us about the very genesis of the North Threadgills restaurant, how that started? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's a comic strip that you have with the book today that uh, explains that, right? Yeah, you can get, you can get, I'll sign a copy of it if you want to buy it. <laughs> Kenneth, Kenneth Threadgill did a deal with a man named Jennings in 1923, 33, built that, built that station at the time. The Austin city limits were at 45th Street. Wow. Wow. And Mr. Jennings built that, built that station for Kenneth, and, and Kenneth stood in line all night, December 7th or 8th or 9th in 1933, and got the first beer license in Travis County, number 01. And, uh, and that and that joint didn't have a key to the front door until 1942. 
when the war started, at Kenneth started closing up and locking up at night uh, for the first time. Buck, Buck Steiner told me when he was 100 years old that he and Kenneth did 30 days in jail for bootlegging in about, in about 31. And I said, Buck, Kenneth was married and, and had a place behind him. He said he didn't go home very much. <laughs> Buck said, they gave us 30 days, but they let us out every night. <laughs> And Buck, Buck's probably the most colorful person that I've ever known. You know, he was in, he, he was, he was in the Rodeo Hall of Fame uh, by 1940. He he rodeo he he was a hundred and he was hundred and one when he died. And I interviewed him about a dozen times. And he told me stories that I can't tell you here in public. <laughs> but some of them some of them are are really worth passing on. He he bought barrels of liquor during Prohibition from from uh, uh, Capone, the mobster in oh, Capone. Ch Chicago. Oh, no, Capone. Uh, Capone. <laughs> he, was in, he was in Cuba with Gene Autry doing a rodeo when Castro took over oh, and, and called Lyndon Johnson to help influence their ability to escape. He said, we got to get out with everything except Gene Autry's six shooters that they wouldn't give those up. He said, I only had one cowboy. I went back down there and lived with a Mexican girl, and he got killed. But he saw the elephant, and he heard the owl. And he was the number one dirty old man that ever lived. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. What, what I've always loved about both of your work is that you preserve these old stories. It, it's always hard for me to get either of you to talk about yourselves, and I really like that. Um, so thank you again for all that both of you do and keeping those memories alive.